It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is John Clancy, founding and managing member of Planet Fitness Midwest. John's operations currently has over 50 stores throughout the Midwest and Southern United States, with another 10 stores currently under construction with the rights to build another 15 stores. In 2015, John was named Franchisee of the Year by Planet Fitness, and uh, there's no stopping him now. John's also the managing member of Smoothie King Midwest, a developer and operator of 30 Smoothie King units in several Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Southeast locations. And as the managing member of Cornerstone Properties, John has also developed a retail real estate portfolio value in excess of $100 million, with an additional $50 million currently under development. John was born and raised in Massapequa, New York. He obtained a Bachelor of Science degree from the State University of New York's Business School at Plattsburgh. And importantly, John serves in a broad capacity for multiple nonprofit organizations and charities that assist in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. His wife, Regina, and their three children are active members of Christ Fellowship Church and live in South Florida. John Clancy, welcome into the corner office. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Great to, great to hear your voice again. We got a chance to chat a week or so ago. Where does the podcast find you today? It sounds like you're at home. I'm in Jupiter, Florida at my home, yes. Oh, you're just up, up, up north of the beach. This is probably the closest one. We could have met and done this together. I'm, I'm down in North Palm in Old Port Cove, and uh, we're enjoying a beautiful day in, uh, in South Florida today, aren't we? Um, it's gorgeous out. Yeah. One, one <laughs> just got to love one it. One of the reasons I moved here from New York. I love it. I love it. Well, that's where, kind of where we want to start. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about your early years. We you know, kind of like to go over that, understand our CEO's foundations. But where did you grow up, and what was your early family life like, John? Uh, I grew up on in Massapequa, Long Island, and I had um, a, a really, uh, really great childhood and, and great parents. Um, I have two sisters and one brother and a um, father that was an NYPD cop, uh, made wow. his way to the top of that, um, to the top of the department, was the youngest captain in NYPD history. Mother was a housewife, an amazing mother, um, and... Um, Yes, uh, it was kind of like uh, when when I write uh, and I and I do write some things, um, screenplays and whatnot. I'm in the middle of. I, I look back on my childhood, and although my parents' marriage was an unmitigated disaster, um, they happened. They just pulled off being good parents, even if they weren't, mm. uh, you know, good good husband or a good wife. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm blessed in that way. We're in the pecking order with the kids. Are the oldest, youngest, in the middle? Oldest boy, a second oldest. oldest. I have an older sister, and so, and a younger sister, and a, and a much younger brother, a seven year younger brother. Right. right. We're both believers, and you know, obviously, want to hear about your kind of faith based journey through the story. But did you grow up in a faith based home, or did that come later in life? That came later in life. We grew up Catholic. And that that right. was the kind of the thing there in Long Island. So I, I didn't know God or uh, I, I didn't find God through the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that later. Can't wait to hear about that because I know we've got a real transformation story ahead of us. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the inspirations. It sounds like mom and dad were good parents and, you know, obviously kind of recognized, as you said, in the community for things they did. What, what inspired you as a kid? What were some of the things that, you know, kind of, you know, floated your boat, so to speak? Yeah, well, I, I was... Um, 
definitely not a gifted athlete, student or anything. I had um, some real struggles uh, in my adolescent, uh, let's call it, you know, second, really probably from kindergarten on, but I, I really recognized it around third, fourth and fifth grade where I had multiple learning disabilities. I was dyslexic. Mm -hmm. Um, I had uh, ADD and ADHD before they were really known, um, and it was it was pretty brutal um, for uh, for me keeping up with class. Be, you know, reading, for example, um, you know, reading in front of the class or uh, athletics in any way, shape, or form. I was a total mess. It was really mm. bad, um, and I was made fun of because of it. Because you know how mm. kids could be, right? Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> whether it's the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, or, or today, um, kids are brutal. So, um, I had a very low self image because of these things. Uh, thankfully, again, I had really good parents. My father uh, and mother picked up on my disability, especially the dyslexia. Cause you, I mean, it just, you can't read. Well, I, so did mom and dad identify it? Was it, you know, I, as you know, yeah. as you said, in those days, it wasn't, you know, and I, I had nieces and nephews. I, you know, Ritalin was something that was really used. Did you have treatment for that or, how, you know, how Not, did they deal with that? At that yeah. The, the ADD, ADHD was never treated with any medicine or anything. I was yeah. never treated. Um, mm -hmm. and, but the dyslexia, I was in a separate class. They pulled me out and gave me like, you know, the separate classes, which was the small classes, which was even worse, you know, f to get made fun of. Cause then you, now you go yeah. into special classes. So, right. um, but it, it was, it was, it was pretty bad. And the way I got myself out of it, uh, was very, uh, interesting and has a lot to do with the long-term story of my life. Um, I got it uh, myself out of it by reading a book called think and grow rich. And it was mm. given to me by a friend and, and, uh, the friend was also, uh, not like, you know, the most popular guy, right. Not a good athlete and just not, not popular. Um, so him and I really dug into think and grow rich and we both climbed out of it in his way through technology. And he's just a brilliant guy, um, and became a, a, a very, very successful computer programmer. And I became an athlete. Um, mm. I, I worked on athletics. I was uh, Massapequa and Long Island in general. If you knew how to play soccer really well, you, that was your kind of way into the cool crowd and, nice. uh, to get a girlfriend and everything else. So, um, I just worked, I was a terrible, terrible, terrible athlete, uncoordinated, just no, my father tried baseball and basketball and it was just embarrassing and I was terrible at soccer too but uh, <clears throat> I, I took those principles that Napoleon Hill had in Think and Grow Rich a book that I still read till today which is biblical great based. book great great book and li listeners if you haven't read it it's a classic it was written back in the 30s I think wasn't it I yeah mean, it's, it's a yep. long long yeah. time ago yeah, yes. So, so a biblically based book, but writ secular for, uh, in a secular way on purpose because right. Hill wanted to reach the masses yeah. and he did. And um, so I, I basically used uh, auto suggestion um, and uh, and you know, skill work and mastermind groups and uh, uh, power of uh, positive thinking and um, and, 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 and other things, uh, specialized knowledge all these things to become a good soccer player. So that was kind of like my way um, through the mediocrity and to, and to burn kind of through the dyslexia and everything else. I learned how to read, thankfully. Uh, my father was really, you know, very diligent about these things. Um, and, uh, and I got to the point where, you know, I was the kid that was on his way to becoming a woodworker or a machine worker or a BOCES mm -hmm. kind of thing to going to college uh, by the skin of my teeth, make no mistake. But once I got to college and I and I really applied myself, I became a, a good student and I yeah. graduated with a finance degree. But that was and I played soccer all the way through college, which right. was, you know, uh, something that. Uh, you know, because of the level that I played at in high school, just to get on my high school team or the travel team where I was, that was, you know, that made you good enough to play in college because it was just the best soccer in, in the nation. 
What age, at what age, John, did you read Napoleon Hill and, and did you kind of, you know, focus in on, so was that junior high, middle school or? Probably 12, 11 and 12 yeah. I, uh, wow. originally. Yeah. Wow. I've, re- I've probably read it uh, 30 or 40 times by now. Yeah. Yeah. And, awesome. and have probably just as many uh, versions of goal books and uh, motivational books. And then excelled through your high school to career with soccer yeah. and, and then yeah. got into university. Did you go on scholarship? Or did you get a, a no, a no, I got into college by the skin of my teeth. I, I went to a two year <laughs> school. Uh, I was really not a good student. I didn't really apply myself at all, but I, I got into a two year school and jumped into the junior college circuit and right. ended up on a nationally ranked soccer team. So awesome. That propelled me to go to a four-year school. I got injured in the middle there, so I wasn't quite the same soccer player at the end. But it was, uh, it was a great ride, and it 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 taught me a lot. What what I was referring to is it it kind of created uh, something that is good and bad. Uh, I realized that I could work myself into success, mm-hmm. but I realized also, in looking back on it, it was all about myself. So it was all about John and how John can do this and John could do that. I had no idea that that um, that there was a, a creator, a, a, my Lord and Savior, that was watching all this yeah. um, and and working his plan. It must have been hard to watch, but <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right, we have to think about that. Yeah. Well, were you introduced to the Lord in your college years then, or did that again come later? How, no, how no. Like, how did how did you kind of transition from that? you know, soccer breakthrough and, and getting your yeah. finance degree? Yeah, great question. So I graduated college with this fancy finance degree from the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. And there, there was a good, good, strong finance school. And I, I learned a lot. Um, but I graduated in 1989 in the middle of a pretty significant recession. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get a job. Uh and, it w- you know, I could say, yeah, it wasn't just me. There was a lot of people that couldn't get a job. But, uh, no, I was I was really bad. I was a bad interviewer or something or um, I don't know, probably just a really bad interviewer. And I, I just couldn't get a job. And I tried to get a job for pretty close to a year. I probably went – I went on dozens, dozens of, of interviews. And just to put it into perspective, Grant, I could not get a job for, like, $25,000 a year. mm And even when I went with the sales jobs, which were all commissioned and everyone could get with no problem, I struggled getting those. The last interview I went on before I I, I walked into a 1979 Marcus Avenue in Lake Success, New York at a a brokerage firm that is now infamous called Stratton Oakmont. But before that, my last interview, I was told right in the face, I had my cheap suit on and this uh, insurance manager of this thing of this insurance company on Long Island, uh, and I think it was uh, Hicksville Road and Mass North North Massapequa, and he looked at me and just said, "You know, John, you're a nice kid. You're not cut out for sales." So this is after me for a year of getting turned down for every job I've tried. So now I'm like. You know, I got to pick up Think and Grow Rich and figure out what to do. You know, this is really bad. I'm going to be broke. My, my girlfriend's about to break up with me. I have no car. I'm living with my mother. <laughs> and um, and and and, and uh, I I just left that interview like t- completely dejected. I can rem- mm-hmm. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, um, traumatic. But you know, a, ni- a day or two later, a night or two later, I was at a, a bar and a friend of mine who I played soccer with all during my. Uh, my, uh, you know, high school and uh, junior high school years uh, said, uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking at a bar. And uh, he said, hey, what do you, you know, what's going on? And, and I'm like, uh, I'm like, I don't know, just, you know, take a, my two dollars out of my pocket for a beer. And, and he whips out like thousands and thousands of dollars and, and hundred dollar bills. And he, he and this is a guy. You, this is a contemporary. From yeah, he's my age. Party. He's my yeah. age. He went to St. Yeah. John's, graduated. Wow. And I said, well, Bobby, what are you doing, man? How do you have so much money? I'm broke. I can't get a job. He's like, you can't get a job, John. You you should be a broker like I am at Stratton Oakmont. I work for Jordan Belford, and I'm making – then last month I made $30,000. I'm like, you what? what, what you what? You, you what? And Bobby was a great guy. I love Bobby to this day. I'm friends with him. But he was given to exaggeration from time to time. So – I said, 
literally, you show me a paycheck <laughs> that shows that you made thirty thousand dollars last year. I'll, right, I'll right. Even last month, last month, yeah. Right. I'm in. I'm in. And he did. He, I met with wow. him again. He showed me his paycheck, and I got a, uh, an interview and and then a job. And I, that's how I ended up working that's at Stratton one. Oakmont. And I was I was broke. I was making 125 dollars a week as a as a, uh, a, a broker trainee or a cold caller, also known as pond scum. <laughs> Um, and, the boiler room, scum, yeah, right? yeah, like really, like you know, hardcore, you know. And I was in, the, I was in the Stratton Oakmont meat grinder, um, and it was time for me to, you know, apply to, you know, as soon as a branch, as soon as I walked in that boardroom, broke kid, right? Like I don't have any clothes, and these guys are dressed in Hugo Boss. I drive through the parking lot. My sister drops me off, of course, because I have no money. And uh, and I'm at your Porsche and Lamborghini and Ferrari and BMW and I'm just looking at this place. I'm like, this is this is my ticket. And they drop me off in that in that uh, boardroom. I do a, a an interview that lasts 30 seconds. Kenny Green asked me if I'd shovel uh, crap for 150 thousand dollars a year. Look me right in the face. <laughs> that was literally his interview. And I was like, uh, and he goes, I asked you a question. Would you shovel SHIT for $150,000 a year? And I said, yes, I would. He goes, you have the job. Bobby will show you around. <laughs> and I, that, and then I was working at Stratton. And That's I, it. That was, a, that was a screen. Huh? That was yeah, a screen. that was a screen. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't care about like the interview. Yeah. They just wanted to throw you yeah. into the fire to see if you were not going to melt. Right. Right. And I'm sure there was a lot that did right? for each. Know. Yeah. If they hired, let's say they hired probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 75 people a week. A month later, there was maybe five of those guys. Left. left. Yeah. Yeah. That, and was then, a, that was their process. Six months later, there was one or two of them. One left. Of right. And how long did you last there? Uh, 10 years. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. I was, uh, I, I became one of the biggest money raisers in the boardroom and that's, that's how I ended up getting in trouble, and that's that's you know the the part of the story we'll probably get into. Well, let's skip to that now. I mean, I you know obviously I'd love to hear some of the lessons you learned over those ten years, but uh, I want to get to that transformation. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, I got into this training program, and some things happened that were really kind of eye opening. For example, Ken, Kenny Green, who is not uh, not really prominent in the movie or anything like that, but was a master uh, trainer and motivator of young men. He's the reason why Stratton was Stratton. People don't know mm -hmm. that, but he's the reason why, because he took guys like me and made me believe in myself and in an adult way, not, you know, not kid college or high school stuff anymore, like sports and stuff like that. But hey, you can be a multimillionaire. And the first thing he did, believe it or not, when we, when we did our training, when he's like, he goes, you're going to buy a book and it's going to become your Bible. Guess what book he ripped out, Brand? <laughs> Napoleon Hill. That's right. <laughs> this is and your Bible. He told Bible. me he'd read it 15 times already. Right? This is your Bible. And I was like, I looked, I, I looked at him. I looked at I, was, I said, this is it. Wow. I'm going to get rich. There was a confirmation. I knew it. I knew that I knew that I knew. And, and so at any time the meat grinder would hit you, because if, if, if Stratton hired a thousand trainees only you know let's say 10 of those would become any kind of producer right. uh, and to become a producer of my level which is you know probably only one out of a thousand yeah. so you know at 25 I can't I went from a 21 22 year old broke kid to a 25 year old 20, 25 26 27 28 29 year old making millions of dollars a year wow. crazy and That's having crazy. Checking every box that I ever had in those goal books from the penthouse to the boat to the planes to the, you know, model girlfriend, all this stuff that I always wanted and I thought would bring me, um, you know, happiness, happiness. and and success and, you know, and everything. I, I, I checked every single box, mm. but 
it really never fulfilled me or took um, kind of that, uh, you know, that kind of that piece. You know, like you're, I remember when I was like a little kid, like four, three, four, five, six, you have that motherly love and yeah. getting brought up like it, that you have this kind of piece. It's the, it's the, it's the God shaped hole. Right? Yeah. It's a little, it's, like, it's a, it's a little kid yourself. piece yeah. Yeah. that you're always running after. And I felt like if I had the model girlfriend and I had the penthouse and I had <laughs> the Range Rover and the Porsche and all this stuff, I would get that piece back, but it never came back. In fact, it got further and further away the more success that I had. Which was really interesting. So, uh, how'd you come to your knees? So, uh, toward the end uh, of Stratton, we got sued by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and all of our stocks got crushed. And in the beginning, it was like they called it Broker Disneyland. Literally, Jordan Belfort called it Broker Disneyland. Um, it was it was like a almost like a cult. It was very. Um, uh, like mafia, like almost like you had to be, um, you know, loyal and all this other stuff. And, um, and I was, and I was very, very good at what I did. My, I would, uh, allow people to tape me. Um, and my tapes, you were like ubiquitous on wall street mm. at that point. Um, because me and a few of the top producers, we really cared about the sale. The sale was precious to us. The actual, the actual sale. And right now we're doing um, a screenplay, which is going to really pick apart this sale. Um, but the sale was precious to us. So we got really, really efficient and good at it. Mm. And because of that, um, we were able to raise huge amounts of money from people we've never met. So it, it was just, it, it got, it, it was just big. It was a really, really big fraud. Now, the fraud, however, wasn't like it. It's it's not really depicted in the movie uh, uh, the right way because Scorsese only had three hours to do it. But uh, the sales force was compliant, relatively speaking. There were some guys that were rogue, but most for the most part, the sales force was very, very compliant. Um, but there was this crazy fraud going on in the trading account and with Belford and his partners that were flipping IPO units and doing all sorts of other stuff. That I found out um, later on in detail in my trial. Mm. So, what happened was Stratton closed uh, its doors, or was about to close its doors, or planning on it, and they created lifeboat companies, satellite companies that Belford secretly funded, that were basically Stratton Oakmont two, Stratton Oakmont three. There was one in Florida called Biltmore. There was one in New York called Monroe Parker. And I ended up going to the Monroe Parker lifeboat and running their sales force. Hmm. So when Stratton closed, Monroe Parker closed, um, and Jordan and Danny and his partners were all indicted. Um, uh, the owners of Monroe Parker were indicted as well, of which I was one of them, but I was a minor uh, partner. Um, so I didn't get indicted. Uh, I was uh, looked at by the federal government um, my because of the – law enforcement background my family had i was able to go in and and do a proffer to the federal government and they realized that i wasn't involved in the fraud so they didn't indict me so i thought i was i was it was great i thought it was a pass i was in the clear but i didn't know that dennis vacco of new york state the new york state attorney general's office was planning on indicting me anyway on a state charge on 13 state felony charges, which would have landed me in real jail for 20 years as opposed to club fed for two or three. Mm. So I went from the frying pan directly into the fire and I ended up getting indicted by New York state, me and uh, the top producers. Um, and um, we had to, we had to go to trial. Uh, they offered me no jail deals to testify against my friends and I, I wouldn't do it. Um, and as I was preparing to answer your question, I know that was a big lead up. As I was preparing for trial against New York State in 1998, 1998, 1999, um, I was um, smart enough to uh, go to the Bahamas when I had a half a million dollars bond. So when you get arrested, you have to put up a bond. 
and mine was five hundred thousand dollars. So that you put up about fifty grand in cash in the rest, you get a bond. Uh, or maybe it was more like a hundred, but, um, so I put it up and, but I would escape to the Bahamas, to Nassau, to Paradise Island. Cause that was kind of like my, my way to just forget about things, right. just escape. And, and Brant, this is a mess. I am a mess at this point. I'm 30 years old. Um, ripped. Married? Did you gotten married at that time? No. So oh my, thank friends. God. No, thank God. No, <laughs> I met, I met my wife. Uh, now Regina um, at the firm uh, probably two, a, a year and a half, two years before this, right. but I was just messing around with her. I was mess. I, I had literally at any given time, a dozen girls yeah. at, at any time. I was crazy. I was in shape. I was uh, tan all the time. I was rich and I was out of my mind. I, I, I was <laughs> controlled. Seriously. I was, I, I was controlled by, by demons for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the habits I had were just completely out of control from drugs to hookers to, uh, I was just out, I was, I was out of my mind. Um, so I take off to the Bahamas and, and back before nine 11, you could get to the Bahamas with a, with a driver's license. So even though the judge took my passport, I, I felt I had a little way around it. Well, one time I was on my way back in John F. Kennedy airport and I had a little, let's just say a welcoming party for me. <laughs> and I went right to jail. And when I mean jail, Brant, I mean real jail. They took you to Rikers? No. Up, <laughs> up, upstate. Upstate. Okay. Upstate version of Rikers. Which next is, worst. Yeah, next worst it's, location. It's yeah. the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. Drug dealers, gang members, murderers, rapists, surrounded by the worst of the worst which is unusual for a white collar situation. They would usually put you in a holder for a day or two as you made your new bond, your bond. Cause I, I appeared in front of the judge. The judge looked at me, I'm all tan from the, from the vacation. And, and he just looked at me and, he, and it's the same judge that did the 500,000. And he just shook his head. He says, Mr. Clancy, do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? And I remember again, like it was yesterday. I said, I said, your honor, uh, I, he's, he's a, Mr. Clancy, that was rhetorical. Shut up. <laughs> One million dollars in bond. And he yeah, slams yeah. the gavel down and looks at me. He said, and he said, and by the way, if you so much as leave New York State, you will be locked up in the same place that you're going to see in a couple of hours from now wow. until trial. You are not allowed to leave the state. Do you understand me, Mr. Clancy? I was like, I, I understand, Your Honor. Yes, I understand. So, so let's just say I didn't leave New York State. Uh, so I prepared, so, so I prepared myself to go into hell. And if, if I thought I didn't have peace or that I didn't have that God sized hole, I, I, you know, I was about to see what real hell on earth is. Mm. And I went into Valhalla penitentiary, oh, no. which is a nightmare. Oh. It is like, it is like the tombs, but the upstate version of it. And it's basically all of the hardcore state criminals that are on their way to, uh, to trial to go upstate for long sentences because almost none of these guys gets acquitted. They go to trial, they're drug dealers, gang members, and they, they go to jail for, for long periods of time. They call them football numbers. So I'm surrounded by career criminals and I am this white like wimpy frigging kid from Long Island, rich. They know who I am because I'm in the paper. So the minute I'm there, uh, you know, they're coming up to me and like, you know, what would what, what, you do, man? Where's the, where's the money? You got money for me? And I'm like, oh my goodness, where's the money? They, they think that I like that I have like a hundred million dollars offshore that I'm like, you know, part of the fraud because that's the way the, the newspaper made it sound. Um, so thankfully, I had a guy, Derek, come up to me and say, hey, look, look uh, for whatever reason, he's calling me the N-word. Everyone calls everyone the N-word. I, I don't understand that. But, uh, you know, he's, he's calling me the N-word over and over again. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I think he's like talking to someone else. He's talking to me. And I'm like, OK, what's up? He's like, I, 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 I'm going to I'm going to protect you. Get get, you know, get $50 into my uh, commissary. 
have your have your girl someone put fifty dollars in a commissary in, in, in this number and I'm um, your protection. No one's going to touch you in here. Mm-hmm. So thankfully I had that. But the stuff I saw there was Brant. It was horrible, absolutely horrible for seven days. On the seventh day, they got me up at four in the morning. I had made bail, by the way, the first day. So we put together the bond within 24 hours. But for some reason, I was left there for a full week. I think this was God at work, right? Um, But it was really, more than likely, the Attorney General softening me up for my next plea offer. Um, So... uh, I, four in the well, four in the morning, they they transfer me over to the courthouse, and I'm downstairs in the basement, and, and I'm surrounded by people that are just defecating in front of me and taking c- crack cocaine out of their anuses and smoking it, and just uh, I'm just I, I just uh, and I'm I'm so stressed and so nervous that I'm going to be surrounded by this for the next 20 years because if I'm found guilty, mm. I'm in for 20 of this. And uh, and, the, and the, to highlight that, there's only a 2% acquittal rate for white-collar crime in Westchester County at the time. So I'm thinking I got 98% chance of being surrounded by this for the next 20 years. So as you can imagine, I'm coming apart at the seams. But as you probably also imagine from the movies, you can't crack up. You can't start crying. Right. You can't, like, if you could, you just get, you, you get beat up. You get your ass kicked, Right. So I am doing everything I can to hold it together, which t- took every fiber of strength in my body to hold it together on the way to make my bail. So I finally, after I getting up at four in the morning, moving me from probably 15, literally 15 different jail cells, chained to gang members, rapists, drug dealers, the, the, the toughest, send, yeah. most yeah. hardened demon people that you'll ever imagine and probably sometime around 2 p.m after they put Mm -hmm. me in a cell by myself for about four or five hours i just i just had nothing left and my girlfriend regina who i had met was you know two years earlier two two maybe two and a half years earlier supposed girlfriend you know she was my girlfriend but i was had many of them um she, but she was telling me, you know, about this Jesus thing, and and, and I really liked her, and I, and I liked her so much that I was going out with a, a model, an, an elite model in New York City, like a real, like you know, girl that made hundreds of thousands of dollars to get taken pictures of. Um, and and I I broke up with her f- for this mm. girl, but I didn't know, I I really just didn't know why. But she was very sweet, and I met her parents, and her father was like John the Baptist, like reborn. I mean, the guy was literally just looked at me the first time I met him with this big smile, construction worker living in a tenement in, in Yonkers, New York with this giant smile and peace that like, I couldn't understand how this guy has so much peace or just, it really bothered me and I was jealous of it. But, um, you know, how could this guy have this kind of peace and happiness and I'm rich and, and, and I, I was just, it was very, very weird, but, I, I went to church with them a few times and it, it mm. just, just being around <laughs> Regina, it, you know, I had that little piece of, of miraculous hope, right? You don't like, I have no shot. I got 2%. I got this, but then I got Bill saying, you know, look, I was an alcoholic. I drank a case of beer and a quart of vodka a day for 30 years. And one day Jesus saved me. I had no, DTs, no <laughs> withdrawal, and then then this guy comes uh, comes into their church, and the pastor lays his hands on lays his hands on on their on his uh, his ears. He'd been deaf for ten years, and mm. boom, he could hear. And this one became uh, can see after being blind. I was like, wow, this is like this is crazy. This sounds like the Bible. Is this, is this possible? Is this really possible? Um, so it was, you know, basically a Pentecostal church in Mount Vernon, New York. So there was some, you know, some cool stuff going on there. But it was kind of hard for me to see. But when you're in a jail cell, you got no hope. You start reaching out for hope. Yeah. yeah. 
And I was always curious about Jesus. I was always curious how, you know, there's so many people that were so dedicated to him. I thought they were just maybe just weak or whatever. But um, anyway, in that jail cell, after four or five hours, um, I just, uh, I gave up. I just said, because Bill told me, you know, Bill told me that, you know, he's like, I, I, I gave up. I, I, I said this prayer and I didn't really remember the prayer, but um, I said, um, you know, the, the Jesus that Bill um, speaks about, <laughs> if you are real and you can come into my life and, and you can get me out of this situation, I'll follow you. I will be dedicated to you. I will be yeah. a foot soldier for the rest of my life. Just please get me out of this. Right. So that was my salvation prayer. <laughs> it was a li- little selfish for sure. But as soon as I got done with the prayer, um, the, the, the door opened up after hours, after hours. And they said, well, your bail is made. I went out, made my bail. Mm-hmm. They sent me back for two more days. I mean, this guy, this vacco was, got a visitor. was brutal. <laughs> um, they sent me back for two more days. And, um, but, but something had changed. And when I got back to the jail cell, um, when I, I was a common area, I was talking on a, um, pay phone with, uh, my sister, my older sister, and I am bawling my eyes out, but hiding it from everyone else because she can't be seen crying. And she, and I'm like, Kathy, something happened in the jail. So I, this again, I forget, I'll never forget. It. It's like, like, like yesterday, something happened, something really, I don't know what happened. I said a prayer and I, I accepted Jesus. And, and I think Jesus like came into my life mm-hmm. and my spirit and my soul. And I think everything's changed. She's I can, she, she tells me to this day, she's like, John, I was like, oh, she's like, because she didn't know. She wasn't safe. She's safe today, thank, thankfully. But she didn't know what the heck I was talking about. She's like, she's, she's living on Long Island, you know, so her, her version of Jesus is the Catholic Church. She's like coming in hard and changing him. It's like, what the heck? So she thought her brother was cracking up. But uh, no, I wasn't. Um, that day, right. something changed. That minute, something changed. <laughs> I had a peace that came over me. They even though I was facing the same 20 years, right, I right. never felt the hopelessness ever again. God gave me a supernatural <laughs> peace through the whole thing. I ended up going to trial probably six or eight months after that. And uh, at the end of 1999, actually, the turn of the millennial was my trial. Um, and we, we went on trial in 99. We were acquitted of all charges in 2000, January 2000. Um, and, uh, even though Vaco came back to me after the jail, after the, the, the incident in the jail and tried to get me to testify against my friends again with yeah. lying, by the way, uh, you know, you have to say this, that the other thing oh, so I tell my attorney is like, I'm not saying that that's not true. She, she's like, John, you got to grow up, man. You're going to jail for a long time. It doesn't matter if it's true to them. They want you to say this. If you want out, you want to do a no jail deal, you're going to have to testify against them. You're going to have to say this, 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 and this. And, mm. and, I, and this was after my my conversion. And I, to, I, I, I told my, my attorney, Miranda, I said, Miranda, you tell them this. You tell them this. I'm going with Jesus. Good luck. So, so then, you know, I was acquitted. It was obviously big yeah. news, big trial. Um, to, uh, myself and, and, uh, my, my good friend, Steve and another mm. friend of mine, Steve, Steve Karan and Barry Karan, all four of us were quit of all, all charges. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love it. So the beginning of redemption and, and, yeah. and fast forward, take us what happened next. So, so you got out, uh, couldn't go back to brokering. I think that was probably not a, not an avenue you pursued. <laughs> no, no. No, but what I did is I, I started a hedge fund, which was probably not a great idea because I just, you know, figured that there's all these big hedge fund managers making billions of dollars. I could I could make billions of dollars. But 08 came yeah. and, and that that ended up going down. But God, you know, I, I prayed that God would give me something that I wouldn't have to be in finance. I wouldn't have to raise money or, or, or be in sales in any way, shape or form. And God was gracious and he... Um, because I went to go help a friend out um, uh, and, and give him the gospel and help him out in general. Um, I was introduced to the Planet yeah, Fitness yeah. business and 
As a franchise um, operation, I right, at the time. Opened up. Yeah. As a franchise operator, yep. And we opened up our first plan of fitness in 2008. And um, you know, him and I put $250,000 in each. And uh, within about a year and a half, that was cash flowing a million dollars. Um, and then we, we just, we, God showed me how to get really um, skilled at creating cash flow within yeah. this model. And being very disciplined, and we've been disciplined to this day. And then, for each one of these things we open up, we cash flow a million dollars. So it's uh, it's just a matter of how many of these things we can get open. Um, and uh, you know, we have uh, in your intro, you said we have 42. It's a little old. We have 50 open now, with another 10 in development. So this time next year, we'll be Fantastic. roughly 60, and uh, on to uh, on to 100, and then. Uh, you know, the numbers, the numbers are, uh, the numbers are great, you know, and then that, that feeds the real estate portfolio too, which continues to grow. We, we, um, own a lot of our own real right. estate and lease back to ourselves, which is really, uh, yeah. another whole story of how God woke me up in the middle of the night one time and told me to drive to this location to find my first cornerstone property. And, um, out of a complete miracle, um, that, that all came together. And that's literally how I built my real estate portfolio on a, on a, on a dream, an intuition that God gave me. And I just was, uh, I call it radically obedient and drove 10 hours to go, to get to this address and, and found a sign, um, uh, of a, a for lease, a for sale sign. And I did a deal with Dard and the restaurant group. And that was the beginning of my yeah. real estate portfolio. Just, just being obedient. John, what's your daily routine to keep walking with Christ? How, how do you how do you keep close to Him every day? Yeah, that's that's always a challenge. You know, running as many businesses as I have, yeah. and uh, at this point, it's between the real estate developments, the multifamily developments, and the single family developments, the Plan of Fitness, the Smoothie King, Cornerstone portfolios. Um, it's a lot, so uh, I have to try. I have to really be disciplined to you know, to get in prayer, um, and, um, to get into the word, uh, in the morning and then throughout the day, because my calls and appointments are, you know, they're just all over the place. So, um, thankfully I don't have to report to an office at all, but I do have, you know, a, a lot of appointments and a lot of scheduling, uh, going on. So I have to get into prayer and I have to get into, uh, into the, the word on purpose every single day it's different times i try to do it in the morning i did it right before this podcast a little bit um but i'm i'm i haven't arrived there i need i need way more intimate time with with christ yeah it's it's a it's a scheduling issue but uh you know he expects it of it us is. Huh? <laughs> he does he does you're hiring lots of people and you know we're in the recruiting business tell us a little bit about how you know what do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in and hire today you know, it's funny. I just hired a personal assistant yeah. yesterday and I used an, a, a search firm. Yeah. I used uh, my buddy, Adam uh, Kadan's search firm. Um, but uh, but he's he's a good friend of mine. He didn't charge me. He's a great guy. Um, but uh, yeah, what do I look for? Um, I look for um, honesty, integrity yeah. and um, attention to detail. Um, someone who's it depends on the position. Obviously, if it's uh, an executive position, uh, it's a lot of, um, you know, culture building type of stuff um, where, um, uh, you know, you, you want to imagine long run you being in business with this person, yeah. especially executive. Right. Most of the hiring we do, um, we have thousands of employees, as you probably can yeah. imagine. Um, most of the hiring we do is, is minimum wage. Right. But when I'm looking for someone like a personal assistant, like I was yesterday, when this young lady came to my house and I, I did a second interview with her, I'm, I'm looking to make sure that, that she's going to be, um, uh, going to have integrity and have honesty. Mm. That's number one for me. How do you get at that? What's, what's kind of your favorite interview question to get at that truth? I, it's the, it not, it doesn't necessarily come from the questions. It comes from when I look in their eyes. Mm. And I could tell if they're fidgeting or trying to hide something. And, um, 
but you know, I, I, with this yesterday's interview specifically, I really stuck to, um, what she was going to be responsible for. Cause my, my personal assistant is full-time job, yeah, full-time. Yeah. And I want to make sure she's not telling me what I want to hear that I'm going to get what I'm going to get because I'm going to make an investment to, to, uh, transition her into the position. And I'm going to be giving her a lot of sensitive information. Yeah. That trust and respect's huge. Yeah. Franchise businesses kind of have a, a history of having retention issues, right? You know, a lot of turnover, a lot of minimum wage. Mm -hmm. What do you try to do that's different that, you know, maybe increases your retention rate or what you're working on to, you know, keep those people in? Because it's obviously a lot more cost effective if you can keep them for a longer term. Yeah. It's a, it's culture. Yeah. It's really having um, a, a positive atmosphere that they come to work with and, and, and maintaining that culture. And it's difficult because there's a lot of constraints on it right now right. Uh, with minimum wage being up with all the costs, all of our costs of good salt outside the planet plant. The great, the planet business is just, a, it's just a gift from God. There's no cost of good sold. Yeah. Um, right. So we don't have that. We have labor pressure, but planet fitness's model is, is labor light. Like my Smoothie King business right now is really tough. Mm. You got organic uh, cost of goods sold, high high quality cost of goods sold that's at all time highs, rents that are at all time highs, interest rates that that have creeped up <laughs> significantly over the last couple of years. Mm. So you have all these pressures on margin, and you have to somehow maintain a culture in that atmosphere. Very difficult. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of balls juggling. Well, you know, we've got the, uh, we've got the man upstairs who can help us all that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you have to have conversations yeah, on those bases, right? <laughs> that goes to my point. Yeah. I got to spend a lot more time intimately and I've been convicted of that. Um, so I'm glad you asked that question because I'm further convicted of it now. We're stewards, right? It's not ours. Yeah, that's that's been one of the things no. that's that's helped me with my business. And, you know, he's he's asked yeah. us to be good shepherds. And, uh, you know, he's out ultimately the master of the flock. But, you know, we're we're those Sioux shepherds, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not, not none of it's ours. It's it's anything that, you know, people say to me, John, how did you build all these businesses? And how did you get this? How did you do this? How did I, I'm like, I, I, first of all, I didn't do any yeah. of it. John minus Christ is John in jail for 20 years. <laughs> I'd be out the last three years. My wife would be married to some other guy. I, uh, you know, I'd have a son cause he was born before my marriage, but who knows what relationship I would have had. My other two kids wouldn't be here right. and, uh, my life would be a disaster. Yeah. So I, I'm t I take no credit for this. Amen. <laughs> Amen. John, we're just about out of time. Loved your testimony, your story, but we always ask one last question and that's, uh, you know, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone that maybe has their eyes in the old corner office and, you know, or like yourself be an entrepreneur someday. Yeah. Um, um, I'm writing, like I said, a screenplay to, just for that reason. Um, my advice would be as easy it is as it is to make money your one and ultimate goal, your first goal, be very, very careful. My story is a cautionary mm -hmm. one. Money was my number one goal and I achieved it. And where it got me was almost hell on earth. So you somehow, somehow have to get money down the list. And as a, consequence of what you do at the top of the list. Now, mine and yours top of the list is Jesus Christ, right? So the cross, that's the top of the list for us. And then down the, down the road, down the line, just cross and family and down the line, just as a consequence of your uh, obedience to the cross and to the father, that money would fall downstream. If you try to put money at the top, it will always end poorly. Yeah, bury you. Bury you. Yeah. John Clancy is a founding and managing partner of Planet Fitness Midwest. He's also the managing member of Cornerstone Properties, developed retail, real estate portfolio, and excess of $100 million and lots of stuff in the works. John Clancy, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey 
into the corner office. Of course, it was uh, it was an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.